Hello everybody, my name is Matt Williams, I'm a tutor and access fellow at Jesus College at Oxford University and I wanted to talk today about diversity at the University of Oxford and I'm delighted to be here with friend and colleague Adrian Clark. Adrian, do you mind telling us a bit about yourself please? Yes, good morning, uh, Matthew. It's great to see you again. Yeah, um, I'm now a consultant, and um, one of the areas I work in is in diversity, equality, and inclusion. I've also been a teacher. I've worked in advertising and publishing. I've also been a community activist for some time now. So this whole area of education and social inclusion is something I feel very passionate about. Just to give a bit of background, I suppose the University of Oxford is sometimes thought of as not a terribly diverse place. I think it's worth noting that a quarter of our students are black and minority mm -hmm. ethnic. Mm -hmm. And I think crucially, the university really cares. The university and its colleges want to diversify for two simple reasons. There's a, there's a obvious, no obvious moral reason not to do it. And it's very important that it should be done, but also it's complete self-harm. There's talented people everywhere, but there aren't opportunities everywhere and we need to do something about that. So, you know, th there is a bigger picture here, but there's still a lot of work that the university can and must be doing. So I suppose just to kick off, um, you studied in Oxford in the 1980s. What, what was your experience of that? How did you find it? Yeah, I had a wonderful experience in, uh, in Oxford, but I had to also have to add it was a mixed experience. I mean, just briefly, before I went to Oxford, I'd worked as a community worker in Hackney. Mm. So Oxford was a bit of a culture shock in some ways in that it was completely different from the 1980s Hackney. Sure. Um, but when I arrived in Oxford, it, in some ways, it, it seemed quite magical because of the ancient buildings and people were, you know, riding bikes and the baskets in the front. Mm. So the whole physical experience was was really quite quite intriguing, really. I mean, the course I did was was wonderful as well. Really, really enjoyed the course. But I, but what was interesting as well, as well as having this incredible experience and you know, in many ways, a great privilege, I also. And some of the similar experiences which I've had before. I mean, let me just refer to some of them. I distinctly remember um, walking across um, Maudling Bridge, actually, and this was like Freshers' Week, mm. and being approached by a very smart sort of future, uh, I don't know, future member of the Monday Club, possibly, <laughs> and, and, and being asked, sorry, yeah, Monday Club is one of those clubs that some people go to. And, and, yeah. Anyway, and, um, and being asked um, whether or not I knew where the drugs were. Oh wow! And that was yeah, and that was a bit of a shock because yeah. um, I just arrived in Oxford myself, and I didn't have a map with me. So I, I mean, yeah. so it was just a, a sort of a, a, there was some sort of assumption there that I, I knew where the drugs were. Right. So that was a, a, something which was quite, in some ways, quite shocking, but not surprising. Sure. So as well as having this extraordinary experience, meeting lots of different people and the, the amazing societies and the clubs, all the things that I, you know, I feel like all the advantages of an Oxford student, which I took full advantage of. Yeah, uh, I also had that experience as well and i mean so overall very positive experience overall something that i would definitely recommend you know extraordinary um you know extraordinary experiences in addition to your community work as you mentioned in hackney you spent many years as a teacher and that's when we first came into contact with each other because i do a lot of work with schools in in lambeth and wandsworth and what was your experience there when you were helping young people make applications to competitive universities like oxford and cambridge and many of those young people mm. were coming from quite sort of socio-economically mm. underprivileged yes. backgrounds what how did that how did you find that yeah, that was, um, you know, again, that was a, a really um, interesting experience. Um, I mean, the young people I worked with, I mean, I worked in inner London, um, I worked in two schools, but specifically the school that we worked at together was a boys school. Mm -hmm. And most of the students there were, you know, from what regarded as, you know, the black minority ethnic backgrounds and families of low income, mm -hmm. high, you know, high proportion of free school meals, etc. But in, in terms of applying to Oxford and in terms of, you know, particularly Oxford and Cambridge, I should say, um, it was a, it, certainly a sense of, wow, you know, is this a place for me? Uh -huh. uh, issues around, will I fit in? Um, can I afford it? And But what I tried to do was I tried to, I feel like, demystify Oxford. I tried to, and I did that, obviously, largely partly working with you, Matthew, but also, obviously, in visits to Oxford, etc. Yeah. But what was interesting about the visits is, well, when we took them out of London into Oxford, some of the students would make comments like these, and, and again, you know, it's really important to refer to the young people. Yeah. 
Some would say that the experience was like going on a Harry Potter set mm. and seeing the buildings and some of the costumes in terms of the way some of the students were dressed in terms of the gowns. Mm. So to them, it felt kind of, wow, this is such a, you know, almost a, not Disney, but Harry Potter. <laughs> so, so it wasn't a kind of, uh, you know, it was surreal, but but real, if that makes sense, really. But I want to talk a bit more broadly about equality, diversity and inclusion or EDI as it's sometimes shortened to at, at the university, because this is your area of specialism. And you know, perhaps to just ask in all frankness, what you think the university could and should be doing about this to encourage more people to apply? Yeah, yeah I think this is a huge area. Mm. And I think in many ways, uh, in a philosophical sense, this is a societal issue. Yeah. So I don't want to put all the blame onto Oxford, right? Or, <laughs> and it's not, <laughs> so it's not, uh, the word, probably the word isn't blame, but, you know, so, so there's a, if like, there's the micro macro issues, really. Mm. And the way I would look at it is, um, it's about, if you like, having a strategy that looks at, I would regard it as inputs and outputs. And I explain what I mean by that. And what I mean is that in terms of pre preparation for Oxford and in terms of, if you like, widening the access, right, it starts from a broader societal issue. It talks about, you know, if you like, investment in education and then the fact that, um, you know, it, traditionally, I know that the figures, I, you probably know better than I do, certainly in Cambridge, I think there's more state school children in, in Cambridge now, possibly the same in Oxford. But to me, that's so what? To me, that 7% of the population receive, you know, private education, 93% of people aren't. Yeah. So if anything, it should be the other way around. So that's not a huge achievement, if you, yeah. but it is some achievement, really. Sure. So I think, so certainly from the point of view, investment is going to be, have to be really important. Mm. And also the perception as well. And I'll get on to that in terms of what's sort of perhaps like rebranding itself. So certainly, if you put it down to a level where you're talking about diversity you know, in relation to, if you like, you know, particularly black boys, if you like, you need to, I think, the first thing you do, acknowledge there's a problem, acknowledge that, you know, this is actually a serious issue, and this is something that we actually want to change, mm -hmm. and then commit to that. I mean, how you do that, a whole range of ways of doing it. One of the ways you could do it is obviously through a variety of mentoring programs, a mentoring from the point of view of uh, perhaps getting um, some of the you know, previous students and maybe some of the Oxford uh, alumni who you know passed through positive role models. You you effectively have a situation where if you can't see it, you know you can't be it. Mm -hmm. And I think so much of you know not just Oxford, but so much of of many things is that if you don't have role models or examples of it, then it's almost seen as unobtainable. Yeah, and I think. That's the same with Oxford as well. I think in terms of the university itself, I mean, if you like from the top end aspect of it, if you look at, I mean, these aren't my figures, but if you look at the number of I don't know, vice chancellors or black professors, et cetera, you know, in the top universities, you know, I think it's, it's actually uh, quite, you know, there's something like 22,000, according to figures anyway, 855 professors, and 160 of them are black. Right. So yeah. the top 50 universities, um, according to, I think, research by the Green Research Company, Operation Black Vote, three vice chancellors are black, well, actually three, including black and Asian. Mm -hmm. So the organisations, if you like, the institutions themselves, uh, and this is why I say it's a wider societal issue, mm -hmm. are projecting an image, if you like, of you know very little change mm -hmm. so change needs to come from the top there had to be what we regard as certain principles when we're talking about diversity you know equality and inclusion mm -hmm. in terms of looking at you know what Oxford could do the sort of four things that I would um sort of stress now are representation and what I mean by that is that um I've sort of inferred that when I talked about you know, the actual makeup of the university, but also the makeup of the student body in terms of, you know, 
obviously if you get more students coming in then that will have a wider sort of impact you know mm -hmm. participation what that means is that the students who are actually at Oxford now, you know, could play a greater role, and that can be done in, in many different ways. I, I mean, for example, I know that, for example, the Jesus College of Oxford, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Robert Manley, you know, the, the, the father of Michael Manley, uh, who's, you know, one of the prime ministers of Jamaica, attended Jesus College Oxford. So that's mm -hmm. there's a there's a synergy there. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an opportunity, and I'll say a little bit more about this, right, for Oxford to have a, a partnership with the University of West Indies. And that is something that, you know, that I can talk about. I know that some of the colleges in Oxford are sorry in Cambridge are looking into that mm -hmm. um, on the issue of reparations, but that's a slightly separate subject. But that's something again that could, could be explored. This is nothing new. Glasgow University did a similar sort of thing as well. Right. And I think some some people, you know, who are would say well this is virtue signaling this is not really this is about social justice this is about issues around um you know if like colonization and the, the kind of historical links between you know um you know the universities and you know the transatlantic slave trade yeah. and that's obviously something which is very current and very important mm -hmm. and it's something that the commonwealth and, and i dare say king charles our new king charles the third is he's opened up you know um Royal family's records mm -hmm. to that. And that is something that Oxford could follow as well. That is something that um, you know, um, is very much in vogue, but something that as a sending the right signals, showing um, uh, honest intent. These are, and this is all, if you like, top end stuff, really, but it mm -hmm. sends the right message, really. Another um, sort of value, I said to the fourth, appreciation. And this is incredibly important, the appreciation and the contribution of the Windrush generation. Mm -hmm. So there may be an opportunity there to um, celebrate that, you know. Um, we, I know we have Windrush Day, but these are events um, that sometimes are just, you know, sort of seen in, in isolation, really. So this is an opportunity for the Oxford, the Oxford University to get involved in the type of things that, if you like, a particular target group identify with, really. I mean, and that is seen as not just as goodwill, but building trust and building relationships. It's a sort of thing that um, the Metropolitan Police or other organisations which are going through change or purporting to go through change, right, are looking to do is community engagement. And that is something that, you know, I know in Oxford, you've always had the um, the Cowley Road, you know, um, there's a very, there was a very famous West Indian restaurant there called the, I think called the Hilo back in the day. I don't know if it's still open, but that was quite a popular restaurant mm -hmm. back in the 1980s. And then, so then there's applications. We talked about representation, participation, and then there's application. The action of putting these policies into actual practice, really. So the key here is, is this, Matthew, is this, I think, Hamlet's point home. The key point here is that um, words and platitudes are wonderful and they make everyone feel better. Mm -hmm. But what really matters is action, mm -hmm. really. And that will bring about change. And I think all those things, I have mentioned quite a lot of things that you might want to unpick some of those things, right? All those sorts of things, I think, will create a culture of um, a sense that this is this, this university, you know, this all this institution, you know, is part of our, you know, can be part of our experience as well. Because I think one of the things that um, you know, all students would ask themselves, or black students, etc., you know, is this the right place for me? Yeah. You know, I mean, is this I mean, obviously this does it do the right courses? And also, if you think about it in a more commercial sense as well, not just from the talent point of view, is that. There are other universities, I mean, excellent universities in this country, it's full of great universities, you yeah. know, who are, you know, who are offering courses and opportunities for these students as well. Yeah. So why should they come to Oxford, you know? Why not go to another university? And I mean, another top university there as well, really. Yeah, I, I, that, that's really interesting. I mean, I, I suppose I would say that the university and its colleges are working on many of those four points that you've yeah. raised, but yeah. as you say, action, will always speak louder yeah. than words and we can and must do more. So I think that's really, uh, really interesting. Thank you. Um, last question. Uh, what would you say to a young person of colour who was thinking of applying to, to Oxford in all candour? Yeah, I would say, you know, do your research. 
and um, I would say that to any student, really. Mm. And I'd say, do your research. Uh, obviously, research the course. You know, make sure it's a course that you're really passionate about. Mm. The course, of course, the course is really important. Definitely. And I definitely would say, and this is really also, it's all important, isn't it? Go to the actual college. Go to the place itself. Visit and actually see yourself in there, really. Because we, the thing is, is, is to feel comfortable, is to feel safe, is to feel that, you know, that you belong, really. And the thing about belonging, I think, is that clearly, you know, one, one of the things about Oxford and Cambridge is that, you know, it's world famous for, you know, for its excellence in academia. Mm. But it's also a sense of, you know, of feeling, um, being part of something. And I think you get that if you get a sense that, within the institution, they feel like they're going to cater for you. So, for example, little things like, um, you know, what, what's the food like in the college? You know, what's yeah. the... Yeah, exactly. I mean, some people may have... I mean, we're obviously familiar with... Some people may have, you know, particular religious um, and, um, sort of a sense of, you know, food and kosher, yeah. you know, halal, etc. Yeah. So there's all those little things that make you feel, you know, being part of something, really. Mm. And all those things are important. And also, if you could um, establish a relationship with somebody in the college, I mean, whether it's an ambassador, whether it's somebody who's there, and they can actually, you know, uh, talk to you about you know, their experiences and what it was like for them, really. And um, particularly someone who maybe went to school, just like your school, really, because if you meet somebody, you know, who's, you know... <laughs> Who's very sort of, I wouldn't say, you know, comes across a very confident, oh, it's wonderful here, it's amazing, mm. and is the best thing. That, I mean, that's a really nice to meet confident people, but that may not actually reflect your sort of concerns, really. Yeah. So I think, you know, the key thing is is feeling that, you know, beyond the academic, um, you know, sort of achievement, is that um, you, you can excel in this place, you know, you can be yourself. And a sense of, you know, that, you know, that who you are and what you are, you know, will be celebrated and validated. And it's something that, you know, you feel that you won't have to hide who you are. I mean, that's very important, really. And I think, yeah, it, why not apply? Definitely. Brilliant. Go for it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your insight and expertise, Adrian. I really appreciate talking to you as ever. And yeah, and thanks for your help over all these years as well. So we'll continue to fight the good fight um, and we'll hopefully see some change sooner rather than later.